Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. As you know, our official sponsor, as always, is Running Aces Racetrack Casino and Hotel. And we are also sponsored by Learn Pro Poker and Website Amp. And in this chats edition of the podcast, we're going to hang out with Jack Lasky and Zach Resnick, uh, who you might know from the Just Hands podcast, among some other things. Uh, but before we jump into that, we're going to introduce the panel. Uh, my name is Steve Fredland. I am at Rec Poker Steve, Steve in our Poker Stars home game, uh, reminding you, as James Altuker said, poker is a skill game pretending to be a chance game. Uh, and I'm Chris Jones. I'm 5x5 five five on Twitter and on the Poker Stars home game. And uh, I don't trust anyone who doesn't have a favorite hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jim Reed. I'm Bluff Storini in the home game. And I'm just telling you that if you want to get better at poker, you got to do it by talking to other people about your game. John. Let's go to Rob. Oh, I was uh, oh, there still. You go. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. John is after Jim. I know it's, it's sort of, it's pretty far <laughs> apart in the alphabet. No, it was the mute problem again. <laughs> anyway, so I'm John Somsky, Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I don't trust anyone who thinks that a particular hand should be their favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rob Washam. I'm Radman50 on the Poker Stars home game and on Twitter. And by personal experience, in the $6 online tournaments, they always have it. <laughs> Very nice. Well, just a couple of quick things, guys. Make sure that uh, you check out Rec.Poker. Uh, you guys know this. We're more than a, a podcast. We're more than a membership site. We're a community. So if, if sort of discussing hands and celebrating wins and all that stuff uh, in the context of an encouraging community is sort of up your Allie, uh, we would welcome you uh, to be part of our community. And also we have a new way if you're saying, how can we support you guys? Uh, we've got an Amazon affiliate account now. So you go to our other resources tab, click on our Amazon link and bookmark that. And then every time you go on amazon.com, uh, we get a piece of that piece and uh, that helps us out quite a bit. So we would love it if you would support us in that way. So with that, uh, let's bring them in, Zach and Jack. Uh, as I mentioned, the Just Hands podcast, some other things going on. Now, guys, some of Rec Poker Nation just knows you guys super well. Some of the folks that were, were out there with us, uh, they don't really know. Who are these guys? So let's, uh, let's start off by getting to know you a little bit. Uh, Jack, who the heck are you? Hey. <laughs> this, this, you know, I'm a, very pro I'm a professional podcaster. That's a very professional introduction, <laughs> I think. Well, we know I'm someone. Uh, yes, we know you exist. I see you in two dimensions. All right, so we've established that. Yes. Uh, many of you guys know, will know me from this podcast from Just Hands Poker, which I started with you know, my co-guest here, uh, Zach Resnick. Uh, Zach and I actually started the podcast when we were in college together at uh, Oberlin College Conservatory, our last year there. Uh, and we kind of started the podcast really as a way to just sort of bring accountability to our uh, improvement as poker players. And we found that a lot of people liked what we had to say. And there have been people liking what we had to say for the last, I guess, four years now, or four or five years. Zach, unfortunately, had to leave us about two years ago uh, on the bigger and better things. Like I'm, I was lucky enough to have him take me with him. But you know, for the <laughs> last year and a half or so, we have a different co-host, James Bilderbeck, who is not going to be on today's pod, but I would still highly recommend, even though you won't hear the luscious tones of Zach's voice, you can still get some great poker strategy at Just Hands Poker. Uh, that's some stuff about me. There's more, but we'll probably get into it later. So I'll turn it over to Zach. All right, Zach. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just kind of fill in some of those, those blanks there. Uh, but uh, Jack and I met while we were studying uh, together at school. The main way we first interacted was not by playing cards, but actually playing jazz together. Mm. Uh, our, uh, we had a, had a couple ensembles, jamming a lot, but we started to come, become really close when we started studying poker together. And that has started a really beautiful you know, friendship and working relationship together. And kind of since then, uh, you know, he's been a partner and, and you know, kind of close confidant for all the different you know, ventures that I have uh, started, including, you know, just hands poker, but as Jack mentioned, uh, then kind of moved on to stuff in the travel industry, had a couple failed businesses and now then started easy point, uh, which Jack actually helped out with a little bit along the way. Uh, and 
then uh, started, we uh, started a fund uh, and brought Jack into that pretty early. And that's what Jack and I spend most of our time on today. And, you know, the thing that I feel like I found uh, that I want to be doing for decades and decades to come that wouldn't be there without poker. So here we are today. And thanks for having me. Love it, man. We're super excited to chat with you guys. I'd love to get a little bit of background on your poker history. So Zach, how did you start playing? Is it something you've always done? Or was there a moment where you're like, oh, this seems like a fun thing to do? You know, I, I don't remember exactly when I kind of went, you know, all in, so to speak. It, <laughs> I, I, the first time I played was either at like a camp or with family. But I know the first when I started to, you know, get more into it was definitely at camp when I was like 11 or 12. And kids started to play for money. And then, you know, I've always loved strategy games. I've always been really competitive and I've always been pretty good at those games. So I got to stay up playing with my friends and taking their money most nights. So that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed kind of all aspects of that. Uh, I then graduated to online poker uh, and, you know, turned uh, some Visa gift cards into a lot more money uh, <laughs> when I, you know, perhaps was not of the, the recommended legal age. Uh, and Rec you know, recommended legal age, <laughs> like that's the, 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 the technical <laughs> sort legal of an oxymoron term, just, yeah. just for all the lawyers listening, you know, right? Um, and uh, yeah, then I had a good lesson in counterparty risk, which has come to serve <laughs> us later yes. and served a lot of pain at the age of it was either 15 or 16, uh, when kind of all of it went poof. Um, but yeah, I always enjoyed it. And that, but that's when I started to really study, you know, before I played a lot and I thought about it, but I, I didn't know what the hell I was, I was fucking 12 years old, you know? Uh, <laughs> but then, you know, once I started playing online, reading kind of sit and go strategy on full tilt and really not doing anything special, uh, but just kind of mastering the play really tight until there's three people left and then play really aggressive after that. And in those days, if you, you know, did that, you could make money. Uh, so kind of did that and learned and liked the game. And once all my money was gone and as I was getting into music and other things, I kind of stopped playing poker. And then what made me really get into it again was frankly, being able to play of legal age and having, you know, uh, a friend, uh, who played a lot more poker than me, uh, kind of in the more like 15, 16, 17, uh, years where, you know, most of his friends are poker players and that's what they did together. Uh, and then I was, you know, turning 21. So I started studying. First time I went to the casino on my 21st birthday, I turned $100 into $500. And that run good is a big reason why I probably yeah. decided to, you know, do, do more. Um, and that led to that summer, you know, throughout that semester, I was playing a lot of poker, studying a lot of poker with Jack, like most nights. <laughs> uh, you know, we'd, we'd study and hang out for hours and, uh, you know, loved, you know, the playing aspect of it and the performance and the improvisation and the being present at the table as much as I did the going deep on the game theory and the hand analysis with Jack, as, as he mentioned, you know, the podcast was a vehicle for us to have accountability, not just for studying, but also to like have good conversations. And, you know, we, we've now uh, done two podcasts together. I've done a couple other podcasts and I always, you know, to me, podcasts have basically been an excuse to talk to people you want to talk to about right. things you want to talk to about. That would be like, just like a little too weird to get that intensely into socially, but it's not weird when it's a podcast. So, you know, here we are. Uh, so we, we did that podcast and uh, yeah, during, you know, during college and a little bit after it was something, you know, playing cash games, something I did for fun and to, you know, make money. But I, I, I was lucky to know, I think from the beginning that doing it kind of full, full time in terms of playing mm -hmm. was just, you know, not, not for me. And I think a really tough, tough life relative to other things, but yeah. the you know lessons I've learned from poker have been invaluable. And now, you know, I play for fun, with friends and it is so much fun. You know, it's right. a great opportunity for hanging out and you know, the, the way my game is structured here, it's definitely also good for kind of like networking. Um, so it, it serves like all these great purposes. I just got some custom chips with a bunch of inside jokes and weird <laughs> denominations that we can get into later. And I highly, highly recommend that for anyone. You need to get your own custom chips. You need to get your own custom denominations based on characters in the game. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's kind of my, my poker background. And now I definitely, you know, may study here or there in the future. If, you know, I have start to ever play like real big cash or, you know, want to do some tournaments or something, but I think, you know, now just kind of playing poker, uh, for fun is, you know, kind of how I'm going to be relating yeah. to poker for the rest of my life. Although for me playing my best is part of the fun. So Definitely yeah, not yeah. Well, trying to get my right. money away. We talk about that all the time. When we're playing <laughs> yeah. for fun, but it's more fun to win, it turns out. Uh, so, so, Jack, I mean, you know, I know you do some coaching and you got some solve for why stuff that you've done uh, in the past, which we've loved, uh, the Poker Out Loud stuff that we've, that we've seen. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about your background. How did you get into the game?
You got John Somsky's audio thing going on there? Yeah, sorry. I, 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 there's a 50-50. <laughs> we, had, um, we had John giving you a, a pr- you know, sort of a preview of how we do things here. So you learned well. That was good. <laughs> I'm an expert uh, already. It feels good. It's all good. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to repeat too much what Zach said because I could repeat quite a bit of what he said. I think some some personal highlights that maybe are a little bit different. Uh, yeah, as Zach alluded to, I played in a really competitive high school home game that has generated a handful of professionals. Could have generated more, but you know, a lot of people, that's just not mm-hmm. like the right path for them. Go Mets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, frequent podcast guest and Just Saints coach John Metz was in that game. Um, and and little Mets just got a big turning score. Don't forget this about is, this. This is my oh. turn, Zach. This okay. is my turn. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yo, would you like me to mute him, Jack? Uh, I think that'd be <laughs> appropriate. Um, so we actually we had sort of an interesting like coming up experience that I like to share because I think it was actually really helpful. Which is that the three of us? So my friend John Metz and his brother Thomas, uh, we actually would play on the same full tilt account. Uh, and so we, we were a team, we would get together. It was just easier logistically. Uh, there were only so many laptops between us and uh, we would talk through decisions together. And we weren't very good. Uh, we were okay, we were probably about break even, but we learned a lot just kind of like going through <laughs> a lot of lessons and like, uh, you know, I'm in a tournament, nothing's happened for like four rounds. It's like, I gotta make something happen. And then we all kind of collectively realized like, God, that was a terrible idea. Just trying to force the action right there. And so I think that kind of helped bring accountability to what we were doing. And I think helped us all improve. And also that was sort of balanced by having like a pretty thriving home game that like, you know, every Friday, Saturday, you know, many times like before cross country practice, there was just like home game action happening. Uh, And just the competitive juices flowing every day, wanting to get the best of your friends. Uh, Just it was a big incentive to study and just kind of try and consume whatever resources were out there. And ultimately, you know, I think we really kind of dove in to online after we were able to really reliably get money onto the site. Uh, But there was a lot of free rolls, a lot of like, you know, caching free rolls and then trying to see what we can make happen with like a $1 bankroll. Hmm. Our bankroll management was not quite there. We, we never really got uh, got anywhere with that. But I think I had my sort of breakthrough um, on sites like Carbon Poker and that kind of thing, you know, once Full Tilt was sort of out of the picture and actually, you know, being able to get money onto those sites uh, and sort of learning some bankroll management discipline started to be able to actually make some real money. Uh, and so I, I've always thought of poker as sort of, you know, I, I initially wanted to be a musician, which I had heard would be, you know, challenging from an income standpoint. And so I figured that poker would be a good thing to do, uh, to sort of subsidize that kind of life. And so what I've said, like a lot of the past few years, you know, up until really, I guess like the last year or so, I was a part-time full income poker player. Uh, because I had other professions, but I wasn't really making enough money doing those. I, I had to really um, lean on a part-time poker schedule to pay the bills. Luckily, I was able to supplement that with some coaching. You know, you mentioned Solve Why. Zach and I both started doing coaching through Just Hands. Before that, uh, unfortunately, Zach didn't really get to be a part of the Solve Why thing. He sort of had to leave Just Hands right around that time. Uh, but I really loved being a part of Software Y, working with Matt Berkey, Christian, and those guys for a number of years. I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot making the content we did. Uh, unfortunately, I had to step away from that. You know, what, we're, what Zach and I are working on at the fund now is just too time intensive. And so I've really had to like mm-hmm. wind things back from a poker standpoint, which has been kind of sad. But, you know, I've, I've actually, I've just been really, really serious about the game actually for like the last 15 years. And I'm 25, so it's, it's <laughs> that's a a pretty big chunk of my life. So I'm yeah. I'm actually I think ready for just being a wreck again, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it feels good. I have to say, 
Well, it's these seasons of life, right? I mean, you might get back into it. Who knows what the future holds, but you kind of make the decision that's in front of you to make and wherever you're, whatever's giving you the most life, man, go after that thing and, and chase yeah. that. And I, I'm kind of curious, like, uh, it's a very obvious question for you too, especially, but I'd love to hear how you put it into words, I guess, uh, the importance of having, uh, at least for you guys, the importance of having each other or this group of friends to not only learn the game, but to enjoy the game. Because I think one of the things that we run into are people that are sort of lone rangers, isolated, and they end up being attracted to what we're doing because there's a community sense, because they've either never been able to make friends or they've been uh, too standoffish or whatever it might be. Um, and, and I'm really curious to your guys' perspective on, uh, you know, the improvement of your game because of having this tight-knit group and or the enjoyment uh, of playing the game for either one of you guys. Yeah. I think for me, it's actually... It's, it's why I don't think I would have been able to be like a full-time pro for any extended period of time is because I fell in love with the game really from sort of a, like the home game standpoint and mm-hmm. a culture of having a lot of poker experiences with really close friends. And at a certain point, I think that becomes hard to sustain, you know, just from growing up, like it's hard to, it's hard to spend as much time like with your friends when you have a developing career, you know, developing personal life, you know, more obligations. And so having that kind of get removed from the poker equation, just, you know, it was, it was never as fun for me to like play long hours in a casino, like without like friends around. And, you know, poker players who play a lot of casinos, I have, I have nothing against this class of people. I think a lot of them mm-hmm. are, are really fun to talk to here and there, but I think in terms of like forging really close friendships, uh, you know, that set of like professionals is not like necessarily the happiest, liveliest, like most positive group of people to be around. And so it just didn't feel like a scene that I could imagine myself being a part of long-term without, you know, a- as the friends I had in the game sort of started to move on to other things. Mm-hmm. How about you, Zach? I mean, at this point now, it's like, it will take a lot for me to play not in like my own home game or like, you know, because it's just so much less fun. And as Jack said, it's like the value of my time now is the highest it's ever been. And the scarcity of my time is the highest it's ever been. And I, I see that, you know, becoming more and more scarce and more valuable uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so, you know, pulling myself to play poker, like now it's great. You know, I have a bunch of really good friends. Uh, you know, people that we have a good time and, you know, also have this opportunity to like talk about certain, you know, work, investing tech stuff in a way that like, I can't really do in any other social context. And that's like the space for that. And I love that so much. Uh, but, you know, so some people are like, a lot of people in the game are big DJs though. So, you know, still going to the casinos and stuff all the time. And it's like, you want to go, so it's like, no, I don't want to go to the casino and, you know, play like two, five for, what like five hours and you know like if you know in vegas with jack or something that's like a different story but uh even then it's like at that point i'd rather kind of just you know show in the sauna or something rather than mm-hmm. you know, go to the poker table so yeah and, and i think that's that's what we run into a lot with our recreational players is i only have a certain amount of time available to play poker it's my hobby i want it to be as fun as possible I don't want to go play with a bunch of curmudgeons that are yelling at each other berating me i want to have some fun so i think that's that, that resonates, I think, with a lot of our recreational players who are working other jobs. Yeah, I think, I mean, part of it for me, actually, and part of why I still love doing just hands is that a big part of what's fun about poker to me is being able to kind of, like, recap what happened and sort of get into the weeds of hmm. what everybody did, like, what are the sort of interesting details of this situation. And my approach to playing live poker is I don't talk about strategy at the table because I think I have very little to gain from doing so and potentially a lot to lose. And so, you know, when you're, when you're in situations with friends, like you can one, like in a home game, talk about things at the table potentially because, you know, just a much more friendly atmosphere. It's not all about just like maximizing EV. Uh, And further, if like you're playing with people that you're really close with at a casino, then you, you get that sort of like in-person debrief time, which I think is like probably the most fun part mm-hmm. of a poker session to me at least. Uh, so, so that's something that, you know, that, that's something I can get a lot of just from 
doing just hands and I have like we have a slack group where you know, we have supporters who uh, you know can sort of shoot me hands all day and just mm -hmm. like having little puzzles that come in it's like oh okay this is interesting <laughs> that that aspect of it I don't think I'll ever grow tired of uh, it's, it's more just like trying to play for profit uh, or playing for profit and you know, having to put in those hours is what gets, mm -hmm. you know, you can only do so much of that in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. Well, you guys are both great problem solvers. Like I think one of the things that a lot of the people on the panel here, we all think of poker as a series of puzzles that we have to solve, you know, and um, you know, you two have done a great job mm -hmm. with your personal coaching and with your live uh, coaching. And I know, um, you guys have done some of those sort of like play and learn activities and rec poker has done some of that stuff in the past as well. Now we're trying to do most of our learning as well as our hanging out online. And uh, I wonder if you guys have, I'm, have you noticed anything different in the way that people are trying to learn online and as opposed to live in the way that you're able to help people without being in the room with them? Because I know live play was a real uh, strong point for, for the two of you in particular. Yeah, I, I mean, they're, they're just really different things online and live. And something that I think, you know, that we did as coaches uh, for anyone that wasn't of, you know, kind of some decent level of skill already was highly recommend playing online just to get in the volume and then to also have, you know, hands that they can export for us so we can really kind of see results and see numbers. So online has, you know, a bunch of advantages for studying, like one, you could be in the comfort of your own home and like write little post-it notes about things. I'm really big in, in general in life. And this came from like, you know, studying and improving at poker and into affirmations. So, you know, every time before I play poker, I, you know, uh, have things written down. Sometimes I had recordings of myself talking about like what to do. And I always recommended people did, did that. It's a lot easier to do that in your own home online than it is to in the context of a casino, especially if you're going with friends. Uh, so I think online, it's actually in many ways much easier to, to study and, and improve from. You could also just put in significantly more volume. Uh, you know, a lot of the online pros always said it's like, you know, I'm only 21, but I've put in, you know, 100 times as many hands as Doyle Brunson, you know, yeah, and which yeah. was true. And uh, so online, I think, has a lot of advantages for improving and, you know, purely from the standpoint of, of learning to grow, I still will always recommend, you know, online. The problem with online is that, you know, most people that came to me for coaching, uh, like I think the vast majority of people find online a hell of a lot less fun than playing in person. Right. Uh, so that you can only sustain that for so long. And that's why I would usually find it's more like, hey, play for half an hour to an hour before going to bed a few nights a week, as opposed to really putting in, in sessions. And, you know, what, what we liked about the, the, the live is just, you know, the translation between what happened and, you know, what you hear from your friend, you know, it's always, it's always a little bit different to <laughs> say the least. So the nice thing about doing the live coaching was not only could I see them play live, but I could get my reads on the other players and see, you know, and if they say like, oh, well, I thought he would, I was like, you have no reason to think he did that. So now like I can be sure that you have one of the more common leaks, which is basically, you know, using, I mean, everyone does this to some degree, in life and poker is a great filter to be aware of it, but you know, wanting to do something due to your emotions and then justifying it after the fact with, you know, logic and, you know, reason. Mm -hmm. That's like something that everyone does to some degree and poker is a great mechanism for being aware of that tendency, um, you know, and, and hopefully being aware of it at the poker table will also make you aware of it, you know, uh, when you're, you know, mad at someone for doing something and then, you know, the, the, the way the events happen, keep changing and changing to make it easier to be mad at that person as opposed to, you know, maybe taking responsibility for things as an example. One thing that's been fascinating to me is just seeing these live games transition to online. Uh, like our game. <laughs> like your game. I, you know, I played in Zach's game for a few weeks and it was a really good game, but it started at like, uh, I don't know, like 11 p.m. Eastern. And so I find myself like up from like 11 to like 4.30 or 5 every night. And I was like, I just have to, I'm, I'm done. I quit. <laughs> so, so, so a little, a little background for this game. So, you know, everyone in my, in my group for the most part has like a healthy amount of degeneracy in them. That's definitely a requirement for, for our game. We're an action game. And if you're not an action player, nothing against you. We're just not the game for you. And you're not meant for our game. Uh, so, 
you know, when COVID happened, a lot of people are not just playing poker a lot, you know, whether in other home games or casinos, they're also being very social. And, you know, it's a lot of people kind of in 20s and 30s. And, you know, so COVID hits and I'm like, let's, let's try a Zoom online thing. And then the first two weeks of like when the COVID lockdown really started, 24 seven, this game is going, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you have guys in New York signing on at like 6, 7 a.m. their time and the game's still going here from California. And, you know, it's actually like almost like a continuous game that didn't stop. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. I, I played a lot that first four or five weeks. It's cooled down a lot now. Now people are playing online two or three times a week. We've actually started up the live game again here. Uh, but yeah, absolute kind of madness. I'm not sure what your things look like, but it was such an interesting phenomenon of like everyone was just kind of like doing their poker thing and having the same social hangs and check-ins over Zoom like every day for hours with the same people. And I think it was actually really helpful and, you know, they're therapeutic for a lot of us, you know, going from kind of no social interaction to at least something. Yeah, just to jump on that for a second, um, like we used to have two home games every month and they got a pretty good crowd and we had a lot of fun with those. And then in February or March, when the pandemic hit, we decided to have one every night instead, just for a week to see how popular it would be. We've had one every night since then and we consistently get 50 to 70 runners. It's wow. the toughest, it's the toughest play money, regular <laughs> home game in the world. I think, honestly, I've got a couple of killers in there, but we're all, we're playing for these rec poker pins. We have so much fun with it, but it's a play money game. Um, but uh, so I know Chris is going to walk you down a hand because I know that's really all you're here for just hands, Go fine. hands. i know these guys but you know, but um a couple of quick things just because most of our listeners are recreational players that are kind of caught between worlds right now so um any general rules for people that are used to playing live and now they're playing online and just to keep you on your toes any 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 general rules for players that are used to playing tournaments and now they're playing more cash or vice versa in this sort of matrix of poker is there anything that we should be thinking about uh, yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a few things to think about. So you you have to remember that you're playing against humans and understand sort of the human element that makes online and live different in the first place. And I think the main thing is that like there is a sort of inhibition that comes from just having to look at your opponent straight in the eyes. And that inhibition can kind of go by the wayside, you know, when you transition to online, it's going to be a different effect for everybody. But I think it would be a mistake to assume that your opponents are going to be playing the same way they were playing live online. If you're like, so, so let's say this is if you're taking like the same player pool that you were already playing with before. Now you've thrown them into an online format which I know has been really common for people. Uh, now, if you're just trying to play like online generally, then I would say that the nature of the game is just very different in this sense. Online poker is about, you know, winning, a, or it's about creating a small edge over a very large volume, whereas live is about creating as big an edge as possible over very small volume. Uh, and the root of that difference is uh, differences in ability to collect information. That's really the main difference. Volume is part of it, but the ability for you to collect information on your opponents and for your opponents to collect information on you, it's it just a real game changer. And so uh, I would say tracked. Then you now have to consider like what kind of volume do I have? have with this particular player is it possible that they have been able to pick up on something that i've done uh and so you have to have that sort of second layer of you know what what do i look like to everyone at the table who is able to track me in this very specific way that i'm not used to so i think that's going to be it's going to trip people up but you know it's manageable i would say start small mistakes if you're going into you know big player pools good stuff yeah chris you want to get into a hand yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know I want people to go listen to Just Hands if you want the full uh, taste of this, but I wanted to get uh, just a quick taste for our audience, a little bit of kind of how, how, how you think and how you talk about hands on Just Hands. 
Um, so I'm going to pick one spot from a, from a hand, but I'll walk you to how we got there. Um, so we have a we have a monthly tournament of champions home game, which so people who play in this nightly thing, anyone who wins that gets into a tournament of champions, and there's a monthly tournament, uh, and that uh, happens, and, and we record the table and we talk about it. Uh, for the silver how, pin for the very you can elusive win a silver, silver pin, pin if you win yes, it. Right. So it's uh, it's much better than the bronze pin. <laughs> yes. um, but this this came up in that tournament, um, and I think it illustrates. Um, a really uh, interesting uh, spot that a lot of players can find themselves in. So I'll just kind of walk you through and I want to get to the river spot, which I think is where we, uh, as the, we're going to be in the small blind, there's three players left in this tournament. Um, and we're, we and uh, the Hi. button. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just so yeah. to get the questions out of the way now, before we're listening to the hand history. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, with tournaments, I mean, with tournaments, there's just like a lot of considerations that you kind of have to have yeah. off off the bat before you can really even get into the hand. Yeah. So the, the prize pool is just one pin to first? Yes. Okay. So does anyone care about getting in second? Well, and so actually I would do want to... <laughs> so probably no, but I do want to talk about this uh, also as uh, as if it did matter. So as if it, cause like, I think that this is going to be also the question that's going to come up is going to be one of these spots. That's going to be, I think pretty universal, even though this is really in a tournament where it, where only winning matters, you know, in this particular case. But I think that this spot is one that I think as a player, you can find yourself in a lot. Um, oh, yeah. But I, I will argue. I will argue, Chris. There, there's a little bit of ICM implications for second place because first place gets the podcast shout out and the silver pin. Second place on the write ups, uh, John does write do the write ups and he says, you know, Jim Reed bested Chris Jones heads up. That sounds so there's good. A, there, there's a little bit of a mention there for second place. So I've thought about that when I was in the top three. I thought a little bit of. You know, I, there's a little bit of ICM sure. implication there. It's very okay. small. <laughs> very do, small. Do you see? Do you see the hands? Um, or like, do you have information about what people had? I have information about what uh, hero has. I do not have information about uh, what uh, villain has. Um, okay, I, I just meant in general, like, do you guys have sort of like omnipotence about the game? Because no. if you did, then people would play much better. Um, no. So that's something, we, we do, that's a consideration. We do, we do commentary on the final table of the TOC. So we actually record the final table of tournament champions and then we'll do a, have a panel. We do commentary on it, but we only see whatever cards were revealed or if one of the players is actually engaged in that conversation with us uh, and telling us what they had. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks. Okay. Guys. So uh, we've got um, three players left. The button and we are as the hero are in small blind, both have about 45 big blinds remaining. And the big blind, which we could argue whether this matters or not with, you know, the winner take all nature of this only has 15 big blinds. So um, there's a, there's a short stack and then two pretty healthy stacks uh, kind of fighting it out for first place here. Um, and we're sitting in the small blind with ace of diamonds, nine of clubs. Um, and the button opens to a min open. Um, and we elect, now we could talk about this whole hand, but uh, you would on just hands, but maybe we'll kind of accelerate into the river. Um, we elect to three bet. Um, we elect to go three uh, X their bet. Um, so about, we put in about six and a half big blinds over a two big blind open. Um, and, the, and the big blind folds and the button calls us and the flop comes, again, we had ace of diamonds, nine of clubs. Uh, and the flop comes queen of spades, 10 of spades, nine of spades. Um, and we could also talk about, you know, monochrome flops and all that kind of stuff. But um, in this particular spot, we elect having flop bottom pair uh, without any kind of other kind of draw. We elect as hero to lead out for about 40% pot um, and the button calls us. Um, and the turn is a very interesting one. It's the nine of diamonds. So now we've got a, a board that reads queen of spades, 10 of spades, nine of spades, nine of diamonds. And we again elect to lead out with our hand uh, for about uh, a third pot this time. And the button calls us. 
Um, and the river is the brickiest of bricks. It's the two of hearts. And this is the spot where I really, uh, we've had a lot of argument and talk about, okay, so what is villains sort of call, you know, flatting range in this, in this situation? They've, they've called a three bet. They've called us down this whole way. It feels like there's a lot of, a lot of high spades uh, potentially hoping to, to get, hit their four spade. There's a lot of queen X maybe holdings that are hanging on with top pair. And it feels like this spot, and this is the spot where I, I'd really love your help in sort of, a, and, and it may be some, um, you know, some monsters, you know, there's probably some, uh, you know, some full houses and nut flushes potentially in range here. Um, but what, what I am really struggling and what we're struggling to talk about is we feel like we've got a value hand here, but what's the best way to get value when we're out of position in this kind of spot? Is it that we should be leading and targeting things like the queen X's or do we want to check and target things like the ace X of spade or ace, ace, ace of spades X uh, and try to get them to bluff at us? And, you know, like, and how do we extract the most kind of value and how do you even think about this spot. Uh, we could talk about the earlier parts of the hand. I think there's potentially some mistakes made there, but I'm really curious about how you think about river spots like this and how you evaluate them. Yeah, so one kind of question to get things started is, you know, we're talking about whether to target, you know, as a value bet or effectively whether to turn every single one of our best value hands into a bluff catcher if this person's bluffing too much. Because that's really the implication of that question. It's not so much about if this hand is is in a heads up game, this is like a top of range hand. So if you're not betting this, you're not going to bet anything, uh, because you'd be exploiting the person from you know calling too much and then bluffing too much. But to understand what to t oh Jack might looks like he disagrees. I don't but, know if uh, I uh, I don't I don't think I really agree. But well, he's the ahead. fucking poker star. <laughs> guy. I I don't know what I'm doing these days. But uh, but to, to 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 begin to answer the question and talk about it, what a uh, you know what do we know about this player? Uh, because, you know, what I would say knowing absolutely like nothing and kind of assuming like, you know, kind of the standard, you know, leaks that, you know, kind of recreational players that are playing for fun in a home game with friends make, I would say that this is definitely like a bet. Um, but, you know, I would like to know, to know more about the player profile as that's really important. Mm -hmm. Should I should I answer that or Jack? Did you want to uh, jump in there too? No, I mean I think I think it's a good question. Uh, I think we're still in information gathering, you know, in the information gathering phase of trying to help you uh, arrive at the right decision. Okay. Uh, well, and please, panel, jump in here if you have thoughts about these players because some people might know them a little bit better. But I think both of these players are um, uh, both us as hero and um, um, villain are both on the more aggressive side, um, can definitely be capable of showing up here. Uh, both of them can be capable of showing up here without value. Uh, could be showing, you know, they're, they're, they're the types of players that um, would take their, their, their single spades, I, you know, I think they could show up here with, with strong value as well. So, 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 so to clarify, Chris, you know, because, uh, you know, that, like, I think this is a common way that people talk about the game, which like, oh, they could have this. That doesn't really help us at all. Like, it, sure. it, 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 I guess a little bit more than a baseline that, like, they're terrible and they couldn't show up with, with you know, those types of hands. But the types of things that, you know, when, say, I was coaching, I would advise my students to look for is not so much like, oh, they're too loose, like, but to look, it's like, they call too much on the flop with weak draws, or they call too much on the flop with weak, you know, single pair type hands. Are there any more kind of actionable things in terms of, you know, the, I, I'm sure probably a lot of people on the show, uh, the panel, and probably some listeners are familiar with like, Ed Miller's book. Um, I forget what the name of the book is, but the, the yeah, 1% or something. I remember reading that with Jack in college. I was like, damn, this is, this is good stuff. Uh, so, you know, at, at any point, there's, kind of like a, <laughs> uh, there, there's an optimal amount of hands to like include in a range. And when you go, you know, what the mistake most people make is including too many hands in that range, you're going to have too many bad hands. And the too many bad hands have, 
are going to have to like get cut off somewhere. And I think for a lot of people, what happens is they get cut off on the turn of the river facing a big bet. Uh, but for some players, you know, they're, they're relatively good about that stuff, but have other leaks and other, you know, kind of deviations. Uh, and some people just stay with the too many hands throughout the whole way. So maybe with that framing, or is there any information in terms of, you know, how they might play some of these earlier streets? Hmm. I'm, I, I am going to ask the panel because some of these people might know this player a little bit better than, than even me. Cause I, I am not, I'm struggling to come up with how I would describe our who, villain. Who was it, Chris? Call him out. No. Or, or type, it in, type it in the chat. Type it in the chat. Oh, okay. Right, right. I can't remember who it was. You're talking about the villain here, right? In this situation? Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you it was three handed in the final table, so we know it wasn't Steve. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. What was, the, uh, what was the SPR on the end there? So they have about like, a pot. There's a pot size bet left um, for for everyone there's basically a pot size uh bet left i want to while we're figuring out who this person is i don't think i need to mm -hmm. know much about this player to rule out check call personally uh here's the problem i have with check call the the main bluff is probably going to contain the ace of spades and that's a hand it can really bluff you on any street. So by the time we get to the river, we're considering like how often is this hand going to bluff versus having uh, decided to raise you in some prior street. I just don't think we're necessarily dealing with that many combos, especially in a three bet pot where you would think like, you know, the ace sixes through ace eights of the world might not decide to call the three bet. Now, if, if those hands are very often calling the three bet, your check call starts to look a little bit better. But the thing is, yeah, a lot of, a lot of hands are just going to have showdown here, like uh, ace 10, ace queen, you know, king queen, king 10, queen jack, jack 10. A lot of these that have blockers that they're plausible bluffs. They just, I think, with the sort of uh, tournament scenario that we're in, where they're in pretty good situation if they check back and lose or check back and you know, try and realize their showdown value. And if they're wrong and you call, out. Uh, I just don't expect a lot of your opponent has too much shutdown value for me to want to turn this hand into a bluff catcher. So I would be deciding between basically shove, bet smaller, but that's a little bit tricky, or check fold. Uh, probably leaning towards shove or check fold. And I think check fold is fine, actually. Um, because I, I do think your opponent has quite a bit of incentive to slow play here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, you know, like two pair in sets don't raise the flop that much in position. They definitely don't raise the turn, you know, with a boat. Not flushes, I don't think raise. Um, and other flushes can raise for protection, but I don't think they need to. I think when you're in position, it's pretty easy to, you know, just click call, call, call. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about check fold, to be honest, hmm. but I tend to just, I've just become such a nit over time. <laughs> where how old, how old are you uh, now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I already said it once. You're, you're, getting, mar you're getting married, so now you have to start folding more. I think that's yeah. kind of the, how that works. I, yeah. I think you can, I think you can also shove is, is pretty reasonable as well. I think uh, check fold, the nice thing about check fold is you will never ever be out of the tournament at the end of this hand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a pretty solid reason to take a line when there's not a clear like slam dunk EV difference between the two actions. If you're positive that every single time your opponent has queen X, they're gonna call you, I still don't even know if that really gets you there because like, you know, it's just not, it's not that much queen X, like is queen seven suited going to play this way. Um, so you're talking like queen jacks, king queens, you know, queen tens and ace queens. There's a good amount of those, but there's quite a few full houses. There's quite a few flushes. And so you're, you're making money shoving there, but you have to be really, really certain 
you're kind of you're kind of breaking up there, Jack. Sorry. Uh, I would say the the one thing that I know about this player we've we've done the uh, we've done the deep research and kind of figured it out. The one the one thing I would add about this player that maybe would give you guys insight. Tell me tell me how important this is. But uh, he is the kind of player that really does like to drive action. He likes to be the aggressor. Uh, and so the fact that he just called all the way down makes me more nervous than it would against other players. Like I, I think if he has an ace of spades hand, I think he's probably shoving flop. Um, or, or, you know, being aggressive at some point. I think even if he has a queen, he's probably being aggressive uh, at some point. So I, I also think he's the kind of player that will turn, a, will turn a misdraw into a shove on the river. But I think when you talk about how did we get to the river in that pattern, uh, with, with an aggressive player like this, I feel like it's more value-y. I think we had to go for value on the river there um, based on the actions that happened. Like Steve said, this guy would have done something more with a big hand. Keep in mind that he opened and then called a three bet. So his range is not going to be probably queen seven suited. Well, I, actually, Rob, what I was – sorry, I been mis what I was saying is I think if he had like a queen or if he had like the ace of spades, I think he would have been aggressive. That's, yeah, that's streets. what I'm saying. I think he's got a monster hand. I think is – more of my fear is that he's got a monster because he just called – I'm thinking he had a he had a pair like a pair of kings, a pair okay. of jacks, or something like that. That's that to me. That's yeah. that's what it smelled like because he did end up making the call on the river right after we went for value. So and he lost to three nines. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah I don't think I think the queen scared him. So maybe he had jacks or tens or something like that, and just called it down. Yeah, thinking that he had showdown value. So, so this is why it's also important to know the player because, you know, I, I wouldn't like, you can call a player aggressive in, in a certain way, but a player that's not four betting jacks or Kings in terms of pre-flop, they're incredibly passive, you know? So this is, you know, I, I don't, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I don't know my, my GTO uh, very well these days, but from my understanding, uh, you know, I would, I would defer to Jack in general on this, from my understanding, I think the default thing to do here would be going for value. Uh, you know, the, the, the three bit size was pretty big for the situation. It was three and a half X, but you have a button open of which even if this player is, is pretty passive, they're probably opening like at least 75% of hands. Uh, so then, you know, in terms of the total amount of hands you can have after they call, you're looking at at least 15%, if not closer to like 20, 30%. And that's just a lot of hands. So if this player is on, you know, I, I think against like a range that plays against a 40 and 30% pot bets, relatively small bets, you know, you're going to just be beating that calling range there, assuming they, they're going to be, you know, calling uh, with a, a reasonable or not even necessarily high, but reasonable frequency of kind of one pair, one pair, pair of hands. But just, you know, for the listeners, I think this is why it's important to, you know, like saying the guy's aggressive or it's loose. It really, not only does it not really tell you anything, it could also, I think, kind of trick you into making bad decisions because uh, a, there's very few players that are just too aggressive on every street. Most players are like, I'm too aggressive pre-flop, but they're never, you know, bluffing river. Some players, if they're checked to on the river, they just can't help themselves. Like really keeping track of this information is what leads to like the best type of, you know, kind of exploitative, exploitative play. Yeah, I think it's also good to like keep the motivation of that aggression in mind. Like, is this aggression because this player has a really bluff heavy image and you know they bluff a lot and so when they have it they just tend to like really fast play it because they're just incentivized to do so because they're just perceived to be so bluffy or is it you know not that it has to be one or the other but for a lot of players it's maybe more like i'm scared that my opponent will draw it on me and therefore i want to just get money in as soon as possible and i think those those two players maybe are both approaching this flop somewhat aggressively with like the sort of strong one pair hands, um, but maybe are approaching it differently with like flushes or sets or straights, these sorts of hands, you know. Regardless, I, I think shove is, I think shove and check call are both like pretty defensible. Um, and yeah, I would just, it, depending on how loose your opponent is and, you know, how likely you are to be perceived to be bluffing, you know, the more I would lean towards shove. 
Yeah, I think Dan could be categorized as very aggressive and not necessarily always has the goods. So he's 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 a little more bluffy than than uh, a lot of the players that we play against. I think, and he's very aggressive. So um, I think that's probably why he got the call on the river uh, with the hand that he had, because he did he did bet. And I think I can't remember what it was. Was it like? like a two third, a third or something yeah, he like that. did he did not he yeah. chose to not bet he did not shove he bet right. uh, a third of the pot right and right. got called it got called um <clears throat> and then showed his trip nines and then the other player folded so we don't know what he had but which we talked about that right like it like you know i wonder yeah. what his intention was if he got shoved over the top is that a is that a, is that a fold i mean what what does he do when you know when and if the other player shoves right you know and and some i don't just I was I'll just say real quick. Yeah. I'll be real quick, Zach. I don't mind the small bet. I actually think the small bet yeah. is particularly when there's like a, you know, an actual prize pool. Sorry. Um, no, that's just fair. <laughs> and there's a big price jump from three to two. Then I actually think the small bet like becomes mm -hmm. like a pretty good tool to have in your arsenal. Uh, uh, sorry, um, Jack, you're, you're cutting out. We'll, we'll let uh, Zach jump in there. Yeah, what, what, I, what I would say, and you might want to mute him just in terms of the, la the, the audio. Yeah, the leg there, yeah. Got it. Here. Ooh. I'm trying. I think <laughs> he's unmutable. Um, so, so hey, is what, everybody muted? What's going on now? What, what you might want to consider, uh, you know, just in terms of the earlier street stuff, just like some quick bullets is – you know, be really thoughtful about, you know, your sizing. I'm a cash player, but this matters like 20 X more in tournaments mm -hmm. where like the range that you can open for three and a half X, the, the raise size versus, you know, say like two point, you know, three, 2.4, 2.5, which I imagine is kind of the more like correct sizing to do there uh, is, is vast. Uh, but just know, you know, know why you're doing it you know, think, think like if this is the type of guy who's really loose preflop, then, you know, be exploitive until he adapts and take your value hands and, you know, make it that three and a half X and take your, you know, more your three bet bluffs and make that more like kind of the 2.2 X's. Um, and then think about, you know, sizing where it's like, you know, on the flop 40% pot, I think that's, that's fine. I, 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 I would, I would be basically just like check folding this hand when you're three betting, you know, your, your range is, is you have much better bluff candidates than ace, ace nine with bottom pair. So I think this should definitely be in the check fold category. And then when you get to the turn, I don't, I don't really see the 30% pot bet, especially, you know, think about what happened on the river, which is, you know, you got your best card and you didn't get max, you know, you didn't get stacks in, uh, and you, maybe you got, maybe you were planning to and got scared on the river. But, uh, you know, I think when you have what on the turn becomes kind of like definitely a top line value hand, uh, you want to be betting, you want to be betting more, um, especially given the, the, the SPR. So I, I probably would have gone for more like 50 to 70% pot in that mm. spot. And not, not, not be so worried about leaving the pot size bet behind because you hear some of, the, some of the folks talking about that. You don't want to leave yourself with less than a one SPR, but you're saying, well, I'm, but I'm trying to get the value and I'm going to get the value on the turn. Well, I, I would be very distrustful of anyone that says you always want to have at least one SPR. You know, mm -hmm. poker is a game where it yeah. always depends. I think that's probably right, good, right. like, you know, advice for, for someone like just get, getting started out. But, you know, what – what Jack and I love to do, is, as, as anyone that's listening yeah. to our podcast knows, is really get into the why for each thing. And that's what's fun about poker for us, not like learning the rules and tricks to get better, uh, more so understanding the game at like a, a deep level and making sure every decision we make have a reason why, even if it, mm -hmm. you know, we learn later, it wasn't the best reason. Well, I think one of the things that, you know, we keep learning as we go, and a lot of us are fairly new to the game, some have been playing for a, a long time, is that there's always this conflicting information. That's the part that's so fascinating about poker is like, well, th this this piece of information makes me want to bet more, bet bet this, and this piece of information makes me want to check, and this piece of information wants me, you know, there's all of this conflicting information, and so I think that's where it's so helpful to to, to talk with other people. We talk about being in community and talking about it and learning the game together, uh, and 
if you guys, man, man, these, this just hands podcast, these guys are geniuses. And I think it, you know, provides more and more insight. So as we always tell people, don't just listen to us, you know, we're, we're all figuring things out and we're, you know, we've got some insight. We begin to bring some guests on, but go check these guys out as well. So I, I want to start to wrap us up. Uh, obviously we could chat for hours and hours and pick your brains. Uh, but I do, I wanted to give Zach an opportunity quick. Uh, you, you mentioned this custom chips thing. Oh yeah. You, you, me... you know, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, what is that? And then, uh, then we'll just give you guys a chance to share how people can connect with you and then we'll wrap it up. Let me go grab them. Jack, if you want to, you know, uh, tell listeners about the other podcast we do right now, you know, briefly and where to find us there. It'd be great. Yeah. So, you know, Zach, Zach and I, our new you know, endeavor, which is you know, really on a much bigger scale than what we ever did at Just Hands, uh, is a fund called Unbounded Capital. And we, you know, it's, it's for accredited investors, which like rules out a lot of people. And I, I don't want to make any sort of you know, big pitch on a poker show. I just don't think it's the time or place. But what I will say is that you know, we have a podcast called Unbounded Conversations where you know, we've, we've talked with a lot of really interesting people. Jack, why don't you, if you can hear me, why don't you try to cut your video and maybe that'll help the audio a little bit. It's, it's pretty uh, choppy. If you want to learn, just sort of get your feet wet, you know, in terms of, you know, sure. You know, at this point, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Zach to, you know, Zach, I, I failed to uh, maintain a good enough connection to give us Ah, so he I'm primed the pump. He had us listening. Like, anyway. okay, I'm trying to fill in every other syllable. We we almost got there, but yeah, help get us there, Zachary. Yeah, so so we have another podcast called Unbounded Conversations, <laughs> uh, which you know uh, is related to our fund, uh, Unbounded Capital, got of it. which we have our own poker chip, uh, and uh, yeah, there you know our our fund is investing into kind of the blockchain and crypto ecosystem, specifically the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. And on there, we don't just talk about Bitcoin and crypto; we also kind of talk about you know the intersection of that and, and economics. But you know, a lot of it is uh, you know kind of in the weeds of like what we're what we're seeing, who we're investing in, what we're thinking about. But then also you know taking in people with very little kind of you know knowledge of of Bitcoin or aren't really in our industry and kind of talking about the overlap and things and. Uh, you know, w- with l- the title Unbounded, we kind of let the conversation flow to however ever it goes without necessarily like a set uh, agenda, kind of in the spirit of just hands where we take one hand, but, you know, we happy to spend 45 minutes on that pre-flop decision. Uh, so, you know, you could, and then I'd say the best way to reach, you know, Jack and I is on Twitter. And maybe you can add this in the show notes. I am Trumpet is awesome without an E because that's the maximum amount the username can be. Uh, and Jack is, you can tell us, Jack, I forget. Well, we'll, we'll pick that up with Lasky. Okay. Jackson Lasky. So yep. time, time for me to share the chips and, and really, you know, for those of you that are in a position to kind of invest in this, uh, shout out to, to Lee Jones, who has kind of pushed me to, to make these chips and, you know, as a friend and, uh, yeah, uh, connected to the game. Uh, the Las Vegas Gamblers General Store, uh, highly recommend. They were great to deal with. They did both of our sets of chips and they've been fantastic. So I, I'm missing a couple of the chips here. They're at uh, the guy whose house uh, hosts, hosts the game these days. Uh, but I have a $1 chip that's John Coltrane and, you know, I love jazz. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we got a $5 mile, Miles Davis. We got a $25 Louis Armstrong. Could be better focus. Ah, the lighting is not great. Um, and now it starts to get fun. Really fun. So who can recognize this guy here? Oh, he's from Rounders, right? I, is that the... John Malkovich or Teddy Malkovich. KGB. There it is, yeah. Teddy KGB is on the 100. And before we get to the 1,000, uh, there's one chip that also couldn't make it here which is quite unfortunate as it is our most fun chip. And it is a $230 chip. I believe the first $230 chip in the world uh, because uh, one of the regular players in our game, of which I won't say his name as I did not ask permission ahead of time, um, would frequently bet two blacks, a green and a red and call it a Mexican flag. Uh, (laughs) And started to say, hey, I'm betting a flag. I'm betting a flag. 
So as a, you know, instead of just having him suffer through putting all these four chips together and he's a little colorblind. So, you know, that's kind of where the, the flag origination come from. We, we gave him, we gave him his own flags. So there's $230 chips in play now. And the rule, we've only had him for a few games, but the rule is only Jeff can bring flags into play. Uh, <laughs> no one else can start with their own flags. They have to win them off Jeff. Uh, and then this is a fun one for kind of anyone in like crypto, or I guess it's really more fun for us, probably not as fun for other crypto folks. Uh, but on the $1,000 chip is a guy named Craig Wright, who Jack and I have high conviction is Satoshi Nakamoto or the creator of Bitcoin, of which most people don't think that he did that. And most people actually have very strong opinions kind of against him in kind of many ways. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that this is on kind of our highest denomination chip uh, gets for some kind of fun, fun, I imagine in the future, some fun conversation. So far in the few games we've played, it's just been all regulars that already know my shtick. Uh, but it'd be, be fun in the future for to see that. But yeah, just the conversations that it has started, the, the fun of the, uh, of the Mexican flags makes me want to do other kind of um, custom denomination chips. I highly recommend if like someone you know in the game has like a favorite bet, like make that, make a chip for yeah. them. It'll, it'll, it'll make it a little more complicated, but it'll be so much fun. Uh, I, I love so, I love it. Super super fun. Like that that's the kind yeah. of stuff we're talking about when you're playing home <laughs> games and you're doing this stuff. You know, you're not going to get that kind of fun at the casino. The old two hundred thirty dollar chip uh, doesn't exist in a lot of the casinos that I know of. Yeah, super I fun. You so one flag, I raise you two flags. You right, know? exactly. A flag. You know, now it's, you can introduce other flags of other other nations, and that gets really complicated. But uh, I yeah, love. You guys it. are so, mostly playing one Davis, two Davis. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's so funny. Yeah. Well, let's let's wrap up there, guys. I know we've taken a lot of your time, but the time just flies by whenever we have interesting guests. Uh, but but appreciate it so much. I think hopefully people got a flavor of who you are, your background, but also how you do things when you're breaking down hands. I think it's so good for for all of us to recognize. There's so many ways to think about, it and there's so many considerations. And you guys brought up considerations that we either hadn't thought of, or you know, we we didn't include. We'd like, oh yeah, we should be thinking about that more. So uh, great stuff there. So you mentioned the Twitter stuff. I will put that in the show notes. How else? Uh, should people connect with you, whether it's about poker and coaching or Bitcoin and or the fund? Uh, yeah, so what's we, the best way? So I think both of our DMs are open on Twitter. Um, in terms of you know where to access our content and learn about stuff, of course, you know justhandspoker.com, and I'll, I'll send you these links. Uh, unboundedcapital.com, and then you know we have a YouTube channel for Unbounded Conversations. But you could also find that podcast on uh, because we do some of them video podcasts as well. So on YouTube, but we all, it's also on like Spotify and Apple and all the major kind of podcast yeah. uh, platforms. Um, so, and yeah, and Jack also, he, you know, the many talented him and one of our other partners wrote a book as well. Uh, so you could find that on our website. On, on what, what was the book? Um, on kind of the state of crypto and blockchain and where I think, where we think the consensus kind of gets it wrong. Very cool. Well, anything else, guys, that, that you wanted to cover that we didn't get a chance to ask you? Anything kind of final comments or encouragement or words of wisdom for uh, Rec Poker Nation? I, I would say, you know, and Jack and I, we did kind of a, a bit of a long podcast on this, uh, you know, when I came back to just hands, I guess, like a couple months ago. But really, you know, poker is an incredible training ground for thinking about risk, uh, especially if you really study the game. You know, as much as, you know, I love conversations like these and watching content, don't mm -hmm. fool yourself that, that just listening to this passively is studying and working. Uh, you know, what is, can be really satisfying about poker is to put in that deep learning work where, you know, you're studying the hands in depth, you're, you know, listening to maybe a just hands episode and pausing before we kind of say our opinion to form your own. Um, and I think those skills for me have translated uh, to a lot of success in other avenues and i think especially for like finance and you know investing and trading it's it's very directly applicable but i think poker even if just played recreationally even with just a little bit of study can you know really go a long way so you know if you like poker don't feel bad about it it's a great hobby but you probably should work a little bit on it and you'll get a lot more out of it in both poker and uh elsewhere great stuff how about you jack any last words it's always a pleasure to get to talk poker uh with zach so i appreciate you guys making this happen uh, and yeah, it's, I, I love what you guys are doing. Keep it up and look forward to connecting with you guys again uh, sometime soon.
Sounds good. Sounds like we will do that for sure. Well, Jack, Zach, thanks you guys so much. Uh, you guys can jump jump off there. Uh, we'll be in touch. We got some business that uh, we'll attend to here that we won't bore you with, but uh, part of our rec poker community stuff. Thanks, guys. Let yeah. me. Uh, I'll, have I'll, a, I'll, I'll have a great weekend, Jackson. I know you've got a few exciting plans this weekend, so I don't know if those will be your actual last words, but uh, congratulations and have a great weekend. Thank you. I've heard that I have at least a 50% chance of surviving. So. <laughs> you, you do. Well, so, so Jack, I'll, I'll tell you right now, today is my 29th wedding anniversary. So I hope that it goes oh, uh, as well for you as, as it is for us. So uh, seriously, all the best uh, as you guys prepare and, and embark on that new adventure. Thank you so much, Steve. Of course. And congrats, 29. Yeah, thank you. I know we're halfway there. <laughs> all right all right guys well send, send me any information but we'll let you guys go there and uh thanks again okay have a good awesome. one thanks guys all right Bye. all right guys well what uh what sort of feedback do we have from the crew i thought that was fantastic yeah that's one of those you know top three podcasts after the rec poker podcast and then it's uh <laughs> thinking poker and those guys are uh 2a and 2b uh, so it was a treat treat getting them on here i think i really liked uh jackson's point about live play really getting the biggest edge possible in the hand that you're playing right now because you've got more information and online play is uh, uh, more about maximizing the number of small edges that you get to express over a greater number of hands that was a really good way to think about it anything yeah, else like Stand yes. go ahead Rob. well i think you know you you brought up the thing that you you want to bet so that you have a decent sized uh that on the river yeah and i've, I've always uh, tried to do that i mean i i find myself in those situations where well if i bet half pot here i've only got a half pot left if mm -hmm. it calls and so at that moment in time i'm looking at well i need to i need to get the value now on the turn and instead of build just doing the half pot and getting potential value there i might just jam right then and there hoping yeah, that I, it'll I, call you know, I thought with a hand like three yeah. nines. Um, so, yeah, thinking about it in a different light where, it, you know, the river is a whole no other decision that you need to make. And you should be evaluating your decision on each street. I'll, obviously, we want to think ahead to what we're going to do on the river. But um, we know that you can get value on the turn that you're not going to get on the river. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you were the first one to kind of introduce me to that idea, and I, I looked it up, and, you know, some others had that same idea, and I was like, oh, I really like this. So I find myself betting, you know, whatever, okay, whatever I have left, whatever's in the middle, divide that by three, and if I bet that, then I'll have a pot size bet on the river. So I do that a lot, and and I think, you know, in some cases that works well, maybe when there is a blank on the river like this, but, you know, what happens if the king of spades rolls off on that hand on the river? Now we're just checking, praying the guy checks back, you know, yeah. and we're going to fold, and so... You know what I mean? We're not getting our money in. We're not getting more money in when we think we have the lead. And so I don't know. Yeah, that was good. But I think that's the that's the value of learning in community, right? The value of having all these conversations and getting new perspectives. And going, oh, what about that? What about that? And yeah, yeah, I thought that was yeah. really interesting. That was good. Well, any other thoughts? Uh, looking back on Jack and Zach, I I, just, I liked what he just said at the end too about how poker is just this wonderful sort of proving ground to understand risk and understand it's you know it's and we've talked about that with some other guests as well and it's uh um it really is it really is and I, it, <laughs> it makes sense that they're they're jumping sort of into that kind of investment sphere i mean i mean mm -hmm. i think if you understand those worlds you can sort of j jump into the other ones a little bit more easily yeah, not yeah, and I risk, came but... I came out of that world. I came out of the capital markets hedging yeah. investment yeah. world and found some similar things in poker that were yeah. just as exciting and invigorating yeah. and, and decision making. Go ahead, Brent, Jim. Yeah, just not even not only risk, but also entitlement. You know, like you watch your aces get cracked 20% of the time over a thousand hands and it actually you, you start to realize hey wait a second maybe things don't go the way they're mapped out every single time that's a valuable this lesson should happen right yeah right. yep right yep I should get in a car accident every once in a while I should get a speeding ticket I should get sick I mean the, the, if you're not then you're running way too good you know yeah. well well good stuff guys let's uh let's clip on to the the end of this thing um 
you know, just a few, just a few things again, uh, we're, we're funneling everybody go to rec.poker and sign up for the twerp newsletter. This is where you're going to get all the information, but just super high level. We do podcast recordings. We do monthly seminars. We do book studies. We do monthly and nightly home games on poker stars with monthly tournament of champions. We do zoom meetings while we're playing home games. We learn from our partner, uh, or organizations, our learning partners. We do strat chats where we break down the latest tournament of champions final table. We stream on Twitch. We have groups. We have forums. We have so much stuff going on. We can't possibly tell you all about it, but I pretty much guarantee you, you're going to find something that you enjoy. So go in there, become a free member, play around and see what you like, and then do more of that. So we don't expect everybody to do everything, but you will find something that you really enjoy. So uh, that's my encouragement. Uh, for anybody who's out there listening, uh, go get your free membership at rec.poker. Tool around. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Uh, we're always available and, and willing to help. Uh, anybody have anything they want to share specifically? I don't know if we want to start with the great one. Do we, we always start with the great one. Should we just start with the great one again? All right. The greatest player in poker history. I think that's what he said people refer to him as. No, it was the nicest guy in the world. Oh, right. right. <laughs> and no, that, I you know, that no... doesn't sound right either. I'm not sure about that. Well, okay. So I that may that, be a yeah. lie, but <laughs> it's definitely not true that I'm the greatest player in poker, poker history. That is, take that off the table right now. I was, just, I was testing the edges. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely wrong. I mean, I'm okay. probably not the nicest guy in poker, but you know, compared to Steve, of course. Well, you're maybe right you're exactly. maybe you're closer to the top. Maybe you're closer <laughs> to the top in the nicest guy rankings. I yeah, don't know. I'm that much seems closer plausible. there. I'm much closer there than I am to greatest player. <laughs> All right, so we have a, a few nightly poker series from August 24th to August 30th. M. Babker, Michael Babker, got his third nightly mm -hmm. series victory. Witchy stuff, Leda, Lega, Lega, Leda Ligari got Witchy. her fifth nightly you know, series. She, she's Canadian, so don't, I mean, you can just butcher any Canadian's name. That's fine. We don't, <laughs> I'm perfectly <laughs> fine with that. <laughs> you know, unlike Jim, I find her to actually be kind of nice. She, she, she is, she is nice. way nicer and, than Jim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was setting the bar pretty low there, fellas. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't even think Jim's an official Canadian because, you know. Hey, Canadians I told you not to bring to that nice. up on the air. I told you not <laughs> oh. to bring that up on the air. <laughs> Sorry. Now then, KB, Doug Barron's got his first nightly series. Yeah, Doug. I was a little surprised that that was his first. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a regular. He's been there at the end a lot. He used to yeah. be in my home game, then he moved to Florida to retire and live the good life. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kelly S. 196220, Kelly Stork, got her first <laughs> nightly series victory. Yeah, Overdue for Kelly Stork. Way to go, Kelly. Nicely. I Absolutely. think she was runner up to Doug the night before, I think, too. Uh, that's that what you're be. looking for right that beautiful the thing pin. right there kelly oh god i'm excited for you and hurricane 1k james portugal got mm. his third nightly series victory that's nice. pretty impressive because i don't think he was he hasn't been playing since the beginning he's a a, a newer uh player mm -hmm. there and three already yeah and he of a course right away yeah of course, we have to, uh, I regret to mention that Oreo Milk 444 Owen Drabeck got a, an impressive sixth nightly series victory. Oh, man. That, the Drabecks, we have to do something about the yeah. Drabecks. Right? Well, it he wouldn't be he a does not report. have the most number of nightly series victories because his father has seven. <laughs> so, you know, there's still some rivalry going on there somewhere. They have, they have optimized the way to play. Now, they're not reckless players, I don't think, but they're very aggressive. And, but they've optimized this pin thing because last night I looked and two of the first three people out of the tournament were the Drabecks. So yep. they figured out a way to make this happen. I don't know. But, yeah, impressive. Owen, nice job. But he's back at the U, so maybe he can't play as much now. Hopefully for the rest <laughs> of us. No, nice guy, kid, though. Yeah. No, no yeah. No issues whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Keck Geek 65. Now, I do not know who that is, and it is a different player than Keck Geek, who is Jacob K. Um, so I don't know. I'm assuming there's some relationship or just mm -hmm. a big fan or something. But anyway, that was his first nightly, his or her first nightly series victory. 
Yeah, I told them to email me to give me the information. Hey, we that I, you said maybe it's a big fan. Maybe we start doing that. Like we all rename ourselves like Oreo Milk Five 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 Five. Or, you know, that could be Chris Oreo Milk Five Five Five. Or we become fans, so we change our aliases to their names. Yeah, please don't do that. It's a big pain for me if people start changing uh, their names. After tonight's episode, maybe we need to create poker chips in honor of uh, I know our, our famous oh, players. Oh, yeah. yeah. That Absolutely. seemed really fun for sure. It yeah. Did. Well, anything else, John, that we need to chat yep. about? That's it. All right. How about the rest of you guys? Anything else that we need to share? I won't call on you because I was calling the wrong people. So, all right. Well, well, if nothing else, uh, like I said, just go to rec.poker. Uh, seriously, a ton of stuff going on, ton of stuff coming up, all of that stuff. Sign up for the newsletter. Uh, become a free member. Uh, it literally costs you nothing, and you get access to the groups and the forums and, and all that really cool stuff. So do that. Uh, thanks to our sponsors. Our official sponsor is Running Aces Racetrack Hotel and Casino. We are also sponsored by Website Amp and Learn Pro Poker. Uh, thanks to Jack and Zach. Good stuff there. Uh, thanks to Eric for jumping on here as one of our uh, one of our listeners. If you're if you're a premium member, you can actually listen to the podcast and engage with us and do the chats and all that stuff. So jump on and thanks to the panel, Jim, Chris, Rob, John. Uh, good stuff there, and we will catch you all next week. See ya.